Um, by the way, uh, how many of you uh, went to the UROC symposium yesterday? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, Zone is so good? Okay. Uh, research is okay? Okay. <laughs> Grand prize, uh, do you know uh, Stuart Butler? He did, he does, uh, you know, he does this work on sort of underwater sensors for, yeah. So that was the one that, yeah, that was good. Uh, and and students uh, from my lab uh, also won uh, the third judges prize and second uh, people's choice prize, so it was good. Uh, um, so, you know, uh, as I said in the announcement, I don't know how many of you saw the announcement that I posted. Okay. So, if, you know, if you guys do really well in this course and you get excited about doing research in systems, come see me. Uh, you know, uh, you can win prizes. <laughs> Not just prizes, the, the kids got 150 bucks for doing that. So, <laughs> but the nice thing is they said that, you know, uh, they wanted to treat the lab for lunch. Um, okay, so uh, last time where we left off, uh, so today my, my goal is, um, let's see if we can get there. Um, so today, uh, transport complete and uh, link layer complete. And Thursday, we'll do network layer. So that's uh, the grand plan. We'll see. Okay. So uh, one of the nice things is uh, in, in sort of following up from where we left off with. Oh, sorry. The signal is not strong enough. I have to start shouting. <laughs> uh, so, you know, one of the nice things about uh, the fact that we learned uh, how to do processor design and things like that, you can see sort of a correlation between uh, uh, what is happening in the network and the processor design. So, for instance, we talked about uh, uh, stop and wait protocol, right? Stop and wait protocol, what you're doing is uh, you're sending a packet, waiting for the acknowledgement to come back. And then he's starting to send the next packet, right? It's, uh, it's, al it's almost like how you did simple processor design, right? If you think about it, you know, simple processor desi design, you, uh, you uh, issue one instruction, wait for that instruction to complete, and then you uh, start the next instruction, right? That's exactly what you did in processor design. And, and immediately we noticed that, well, this is inefficient resource of all those resources that are lying idle, right? You know, all these functional units are lying idle. And we said, well, let's do pipelining so that we can use all the resources by having multiple um, instructions in flight, right? And pipeline protocol is exactly the same thing. Network resources are lying idle when you send one packet and then wait for it to be acknowledged, right? So instead what you want to do is you want to send a whole bunch of packets so that you can use all the network resources um, uh, because you know that uh, even though we sort of uh, um, logically or in an abstract fashion show two endpoints connected by a wire, it's not just a wire that is going from here to Bangalore, right? So there's a whole bunch of uh, switches and routers and things like that. And all of those devices, you want to make them, you know, all, all the time uh, chugging away, which means that you want to send packets. And of course, from a personal or uh, selfish point of view, um, if you want to get your message there quickly, you want to send them in a pipeline fashion, right? So, uh, and one of the nice things about uh, uh, protocol, network protocol as opposed to processor design, uh, what is the difference that you see between say instructions, multiple instructions in flight and packets in flight? What's the difference that you see? Any difference? Shane? Completely, completely independent, right? Packets are completely independent. So instructions you had to worry about, oh, these instructions are dependent on one another, all those kinds of things you had to do. Here, uh, you're free, right? You just blast the packets and they're all going to get there. And some of them, you know, Shashank was pointing out that they can, mis get, can get misrouted and so on. But eventually, they'll all get there, right? Uh, even in the class, we were able to do that. 
right, get, get the packets to the destination um, even if it gets dropped along, along the way. So that is the idea behind um, uh, pipeline protocol. So the, the idea being that you want to send a whole bunch of packets uh, one after the other. Um, now as, as I said, uh, you know, when, when you, the, one of the inefficiencies of stop and wait protocol is the fact that um, you, are, you are presupposing that failure is going to happen, right? That's the reason you're waiting for an act. You're presupposing failures can happen and therefore you're waiting for an act before you'll send the next packet. Here we are taking the exact opposite approach and saying that, well, no, nothing is going to ba go bad. Uh, let's just blast the packet. It will all get sent. But will it? Especially if you're going across continents, things can go bo uh, really bad, right? And, and uh, so you, what you, do want, you do want some acknowledgments to come back, okay? Now, one of the nice things is that, you know, when I send these packets, you know, uh, let's say that I, I, I'm being a little bit cautious. I send a bunch of packets. If I have 100 packets to send, let's say I send 10 packets, okay? When can I send, start sending the next 10 packets? Do I, do I have to wait for all the packets or to be acknowledged? If I, if I hear back one acknowledgement, then immediately know that, oh, okay, you know, the packet is getting through, so I can start sending more packets, right? So in that sense, you know, in principle, what I want to do is I want to send these packets and I want to wait for acknowledgements for all the packets to be acknowledged. There are one of two ways of doing the acknowledgements, right? One way is to individually acknowledge each packet, okay? Suppose I'm sending a packet to Shweb and, and, and he says, okay, I got packet number one. I send, you know, then he gets packet number two, he acknowledges packet number two and so on and so forth. So he's going to keep sending me acknowledgements. And, and so long as they get all the acknowledgements, I'm happy and I can, and I can then... Uh, 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 continue with, uh, with sending more packets, okay? Now two questions come up. One is, do I have to acknowledge each packet? What can I do? Well, if, if I do first packet and last packet, then between the first and last packet, I, I have no idea as a sender, I don't know whether the intermediate packets got in or not, and what am I going to do if I don't hear back from you in a, in a timely manner? Then, then what will I do if I think it is dropped? I resend it, right? So I'm going to resend the packets, and that's overloading the network unnecessarily, right? So there is sort of an optimum, you know, middle ground, not optimum, but a middle ground in terms of uh, what you do. You can do what is called cumulative acts, right? So, so let's say that you know I send 100, you know, I'm going to send 100 packets to show it. I send 10 packets, and uh, and and remember that if uh, if I'm sitting in Atlanta and uh, Shoeb is here, but if let's say that, you know, he is somewhere else, uh, maybe in Japan on a holiday, right? And, and, he, and, and, and he gets, you know, the, the, the arrival of the first packet is going to take a long time, right? Because it is traversing a long distance. But once he gets the first packet, let's say there's no packet losses. Once he gets the first packet, how soon is he going to get the second packet and third packet and so on? Right after, one, one after the other, because that's the way we structured it, right? So it's going to tra take a long time to traverse, but once he gets the first packet, the second, third, fourth, and so on, they're going to come very close together, one, and after, one after the other. So one thing that you may be able to do is, well, let me not be immediately sending an act, okay? So if I get 10 packets, then, you know, I'm going to take those 10 packets and I'm going to say acknowledge the 10th packet. Is that idea clear? So that's what is called a cumulative act. Now, when, he, when I get the acknowledgement for 10 to packet number 10, my assumption is going to be that, oh, he got all the 10 packets, okay? Is that idea clear? Now, it is possible that out of the 10 packets, first five packets arrived, six packet got dropped along the way, seven packet arrived to Shoeb. What is Shoeb going to do? He will acknowledge five because five consecutive packets have arrived, six packet hasn't arrived, right? And so he's going to send an acknowledgement saying that I got packet number five, right? Which, which tells me that, oh, he, you know, he got only packet up to five. He didn't get packet number six. I'm going to resend uh, packet number six. Well, not, not, he doesn't know it is dropped. All he's looking at is what are the packets he's receiving, right? So he got packet number one, two, three, four, five. Okay? Then he gets packet number seven, right? So he gets packet number seven, then he knows that, well, you know, packet number six is either very slow, right, or got dropped, right? One of the two things happened. And in either case, what he's going to say is, uh, you know, if he's doing cumulative acts, 
he could simply send uh, an, an acknowledgement for packet number 5. Okay, that is one possibility. What is the other possibility? What is the other possibility? He could also do the following. He did not get packet number 6, right? So he can send a negative acknowledgement for packet number 6. He got up to 5, then he got 7. Okay, because if, I, if he sends me a positive acknowledgement for 5, then what I am going to say is, oh, he got up to 5, maybe I have to send 6, 7, 8 and so on, right? Now on the other hand, suppose he sends me a negative acknowledgement for 6, then I know that packet 6 he did not get for sure. He is sending me, sending me a negative acknowledgement, right? So I am going to send him packet number 6. And, and meanwhile, maybe 7, 8, 9 and 10 arrived uh, 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 for sure. So he gets all the 10 packets. So the next thing that he is going to send me is a positive acknowledgement for packet number 10, right? So these are different games that you can play in terms of protocol design in, in trying to network protocol, the transport protocol design in terms of reducing um, the number of overhead packets. These are what are called overhead packets because acknowledgement is really an overhead, right? Because real data is what I want to send to him. And, and unfortunately, I want to know that these data got through. So I have to get acknowledgement and that is overhead, okay? And, and we want to limit the amount of overhead as much as possible. Just like we did in the case of processor design or operating system, you know, the scheduler and things like that. We want to reduce the amount of overhead that, that we incur in uh, doing any system C activity, okay? And, and acknowledgement is a system C activity. We want to reduce the overhead. Is that idea clear? Okay. Now, suppose I have 100 packets to send to Shoaib. Why don't I just blast the 100 packets? Why do I sit, I will send 10 packets, wait for a while and then start sending the 11 packet and so on. Uh, Chris, any reason why I may not want to just blast all the 10, 100 packets? Oh, so uh, it increases the problem, but you know, uh, I am being uh, greedy, right? I mean, uh, I am saying, well, the network is mine. <laughs> I'm going to send all the packets. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that, Peter? Pardon me. Okay. So first thing is Peter is being a nice guy, <laughs> right? He's saying that well, you know, I'm not the only one that's using it, but others are also using it, right? That's uh, 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 that's a consideration that you have for others who may be also using the network. We'll talk about that in a minute. But even let's say that I'm not a nice guy. Okay. Even if not, I'm not a nice guy. Why is it that I may not want to do that, Ron? Um, no, nothing, nothing to do with slow. I mean, so the connection speed, it only says how quickly I can place these packets one after the other on the wire, right? So depending on the bandwidth that you have out of your machine, that is the rate at which you can place the bits on the wire, okay? And, and so you are going to do it. Uh, I mean, if, if I am greedy, I can say, you know, I have a, a one megabit per second connection and I am going to just put all the packets on the wire. It is going to take some time to put it on the wire. But my hope is that once I put it on the wire, it's going to get there very quickly. Sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. So, so you, I, I may not even think about the uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, receiver, right? Because I'm a greedy, selfish guy. I'm not thinking about anybody else but me, right? And if I think about me, what I have to do is I know exactly for what the reason that you said that packets can get lost, right? And we said that we may have to retransmit the packet. What does that mean? At my end, all the packets that I sent out, I had to buffer them until I know that the uh, recipient has gotten the packets, right? So if I blast 100 packets, then I need a buffer size, which is 100, 100 in size, right? Depending on the size of the message, the buffer size can be really, really big. So purely for selfish reason, you know, not being a nice guy, purely for selfish reason, Protocols say, well, you know, we cannot send all the packets at the same time. We're going to send a bunch of packets given by the buffer capacity. And, and Shoaib is absolutely right. So the other thing that happens is that you sort of negotiate with the receiver, you know, how, how much buffer capacity that the receiver is going to have. So based on that, you decide that this is the number of packets I can send at a time. Is that idea clear? All of the, see, we talked about several different kinds of delays, right? So one kind of delay is from your machine placing the bits on the wire. 
that delay is governed by the speed at which you can actually, you know, the bandwidth connect, or connectivity that you have to the, to the network, right? That, then it leaves your machine, goes to a switch. Now Peter said there are several others who are sending messages also, which means that at the switch, lots of messages are coming in and they're going to get queued up, right? And, and, uh, and, and that's what is called queuing delay. And does it happen once? How many times does it happen, the queuing delay? Pardon me? Well, how many times can it happen, John? Well, it can happen several times. Right? So there are, as I said, even though logically we show the two endpoints connected by a wire, we know there is a whole bunch of switches in between, right? At every one of those switches, there could be a queuing delay, right? I mean, if you're incredibly lucky, nobody is sending anything, then maybe there won't be any queuing delay. It is just, you know, packets come in, immediately it's, it's uh, sent on its output link and things go very smoothly. But the minute there is lots of people communicating, you're going to get that. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the idea behind pipeline protocol that you want to send um, acknowledgments. And as I said, the, uh, uh, the first, the, the, uh, what you, what, at the sender side, what you're going to see is you send a bunch of packets and then after some amount of delay, you're going to get the first acknowledgment, right? And, and the delay is two tau, where tau is the transmission delay in one way. So we are always looking at round trip, right? And I mentioned why we look at round trip. Why, why is it that we look at round trip, James? Why do we look at round trip rather than one way delay? Why is that that we, why cannot I just take the one way and then double it? So uh, because we may be taking different routes and so on. So you really want to know what the round trip delay is, right? And uh, so that's why we look at the round trip delay to decide, you know, um, or retransmission timeout and things like that. And, and based on that, I'm going to get an acknowledgement at some point of time. I don't have to wait for all the acknowledgement before I start transmitting again, right? Because the minute I get the first acknowledgement, I know that, you know, the other acknowledgement should be on the way. So I can send at least the next packet. Hopefully the next acknowledgement is going to come. I can send the next packet and so on. So you can see the pipeline happening here, right? So if, if, I, if I don't get these acknowledgements, I'm, I'm not going to send any more of these packets. But the minute I get the first acknowledgement, I know that, oh, okay, things are cool. I can start sending uh, the next packet. And hopefully the next acknowledgement is going to immediately follow and so on and so forth, right? That's how we get reliability to the pipeline protocol. So we start with the pipeline protocol and we know that it can be unreliable, you know, in the case of process of pipeline, we didn't have to worry about that, right? Because you don't get, you don't have to have acknowledgement back to the fetch stage from the memory stage. <laughs> but here we need uh, acknowledgement and end-to-end -end acknowledgement. And, and that's what you're getting here. And as soon as you get the acknowledgement for the, for the first packet, then you can start sending the subsequent packets and so on. And this is the timeline at the sender, right? And um, so if you look at a space, this is what is called a space-time uh, uh, diagram. And, and basically what's going on is you send a packet and the guy acknowledge, acknowledges the packet. So you send a bunch of packets and then you wait. And the amount of time that you wait before you, reach, uh, 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 you start sending again is the round trip delay, right? And once you get the round trip delay and things are good, right? There no, nothing is getting lost and so on. So you're going to get the first act. And as soon as you get the first act, you start sending the packets again. So this is how time progresses and packet flow progresses and this is how the acknowledgements are. Uh, coming back from the uh, uh, from the receiver, um, and uh, so in order to do this, you need uh, to structure your. I mean, I said you know uh, in network transmission, there's going to be overhead because the real data is here. This is the data that you want to send, right? And but unfortunately, in order to send the packet, I have to tell uh, uh, my immediate uh, access network uh, what is the destination that I want to send it to. Right? And that's the header part of a, of a packet, right? And the header part of the packet is going to contain the destination address. It's going to contain the source address. And um, I mean, these are all dependent on the specifics of the protocol, right? The specifics of the transport protocol, what all things get into the header. But uh, these are uh, potentially things that you might find in the header of a packet. What is the destination address? What is the source address? These are two important things that are absolutely essential, right? And, and how big is the number of packets? And this is saying, you know, our packets can go out of order. And we remember that the uh, uh, destination has to allocate a buffer for assembling all the packets. And how big is the buffer that they have to allocate when, a, when, the, when the first packet uh, comes in? 
um, you, you can get that by looking at this field and saying, well, even if I got packet number 5 out of a 100, 100 sized packet, but if it says that, oh, the number of packets in this message is 100, then I know that the buffer size I have to allocate as a receiver is 100 big, right? And then I can start assembling all the packets as they come in. And, and the sequence number, we talked about that last time. So this is the thing that tells me that I'm getting uh, all the packets in, in sequence, right? And that's the sequence number. And packet size is saying how big is individual packets. And we talked about checksum also. What, what is the reason for the checksum, Nick? Why did we have checksum? No clue? Uh, what's your name? Mike? Add, who is going to add anything to the packet? Uh, let's say there is a good world. We are all very good people. No malicious nothing. Uh, uh, Sean, no. what's your name? Owen, Owen, sorry, yeah, Owen. Corrupted, right? So why can it get corrupted? Yeah, you see, you know, lots of things can go wrong. You know, even within we talked about, even within a box, you know, there are alpha particles and things like that, and you know, uh, and 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 memory can get get corrupted and so on. So the packets can get corrupted, and 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 uh, so what exactly is a checksum, Owen? It can be as sophisticated as you want, but one simple thing that is done in network transmission usually is you take, you know, you, you treat the uh, packet as a whole bunch of, uh, you know, let's say integers, right? So 128 bytes, you can say that it is made up of, you know, each, uh, the, the entire packet is made up of 16-bit uh, um, integers, okay? Then you just add them up. Add them up and you get a number and you affix it to the end of the uh, uh, packet at, this, at, this, at the source. That is what is called a checksum, okay? And at the receiving end, what are we going to do, Owen? Yeah, so we do the same thing. So you just add up the packet because you know the packet size. The packet size doesn't include the checksum, right? So you, you know the packet size. You can do the, exactly the same algorithm with the receiver. And once you've done it, you got a checksum at the receiving end. Then you compare it against the checksum that the sender sent you. If the two agree, life is good, right? If they don't, then you know that there is a... Uh, an error, and it is exactly as though the packet got dropped somewhere in the middle. So what you're going to do is you send a negative acknowledgement, saying that oh I didn't get sequence. You got a packet, but you're going to just say I didn't get sequence number such and so, right? So you know either you get the message um, and it is corrupted, or you don't get the uh, you get the packet and it is corrupted, or you don't get the packet. Both cases you can treat it exactly the same way as the receiver sending a negative acknowledgement for that particular. Uh, sequence number. Everybody with me here on this? Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so that's uh, uh, how the uh, 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 the packet looks like, uh, and and so you know when we talk about uh, a message, and actually I should say a packet. <coughs> when we say packet, it always consists of two parts: the header and then the payload. So payload is the actual data. And this is the thing that is used by, uh, for routing purposes, right? Um, and, and all the other overhead functions that you, that you need, need to do in order to get your packet from source to destination, okay? And uh, so now we'll talk about uh, network congestion. So, uh, so, uh, so Peter already mentioned that, uh, that the reason you don't want to blast all the packets is because you want to be nice. And I also said that even from a selfish perspective, um, you want to reduce the amount of uh, um, uh, packets that you place on the wire at any point of time because um, you have to worry about retransmission, which means that you have to allocate buff buffer size and so on. And, and the analogy, uh, uh, the, 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 the reason why you do this is because uh, there is this notion of network congestion. And, and, and uh, you, know how all, you all know how highways are uh, designed, right? You have surface streets and you have highways. And, uh, and, and, and similarly, network is also designed in a similar manner that you know, the uh, bandwidth coming out of your laptop may be one megabit or 10 megabits or 100 megabits or even a gigabit, right? 
but uh, if all these uh, that is like the surface street right of, a, uh, of the transportation network um, and now this is getting, going to get on the highway. On the highway you got multiple lanes and things can go at a much faster speed, no traffic lights and so on right. So it can, it can go much faster and, and uh, so, so what happens with, uh, with network also is exactly the same thing that you have got all these uh, different uh, individual connections coming in and then they go through a big fat pipe. This is like the highway right. This is like the highway and all these things go through, um, uh, go through this. And uh, so, uh, so this is coming at 1 gigabits per second and this is coming at 1 gigabits per second and this is at 10 gig gigabits per second. Things are good right. So there will never be any you know I mentioned queuing delay right. So there should not be any queuing delay because all of these should flow through uh, quite easily. Is that true? Will that work? So if things are like this that you know the number of. Uh, so for, for there to be no queuing delay, what should be the what should be uh, the design criterion for there to be no queuing delay, Vladimir? Oh, so let's say double it, right? So we make it full duplex. I'm saying. So by the way, there, there is a terminology which I've forgotten to mention, which is half duplex and full duplex. Is that is that uh, uh, familiar, Maba? What is uh, half duplex and what is full duplex? one direction right. So you can either send or you can you can receive you cannot do both right that is half duplex connection. Full duplex is when you can do both right and that is exactly what we assume in the pipeline protocol that it is a full duplex connection you are sending packets and you are receiving acknowledgments at the same time right and that is what is called full duplex connection okay and, and Vladimir is saying that you know you have to think about not just traffic going this way but results coming back also. Uh, and, and so let us say that you know we are going to take that into account. What is the criterion that I need in order to make sure that there is no queuing delay? Nate, what is the criterion? Just, just get, I mean I have not told you what it is. You can guess, wild guess, it does not really matter. Think, think of uh, highways and uh, surface streets, right. Oh, so, um, so, so let us say that there is a router sitting here. Let us let us say that you know let us make life real simple right. There is a router sitting here and, and, and all of these connections are coming in and once they come in they are going to go out right. So what should be the, the criterion for, uh, uh, for the, for the, for the uh, bandwidth that is available here and the bandwidth that is coming in Ron. At least the size of all this see suppose I make sure that there are no more than 10 such things feeding into this then I will never have queuing delays right. Because I can at most put 1 gigabits per second right and if all 10 guys do that still I have enough capacity here to, to carry all those flows right. But is that, is that true? Think about, think about your highways right. So why do you get backups on surface streets? So, there are two <laughs> so Ron said people drive fast. Um, actually if people drive fast but uniformly there should not be any you know, but you know people weep through traffic and suddenly break and all these kinds of things happen right. So the, 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 the analogy again with the, with the surface streets and highways is that there are more surface streets than the, than the, than the capacity of the highway right and that is the reason that you see a backup when you you know when you when you are going in busy times um, rush hour and so on the backup happens because uh, you know uh, people are trying to you know, I have shown you getting in but there are also people getting off right. So both people getting in and getting off they start backing up and that is how uh, um, you have congestion on the, uh, on, on, on the highway and it is exactly the same thing that happens on the network right. Everybody is so there is not just 4 flows coming in there are probably hundreds of flows coming in and we are hoping that not, not all of them are sending uh, bits at the same time right. So it is sort of like the airline overbooking right you are hoping that if I have 250 seats I sell 300 seats hope that 50 won't show up <laughs> but if all of them show up what are you going to do the airline what it does is it gives you a freebie right so it says that okay you know uh, you can get a free trip to hawaii uh, if you uh, get off the plane right um, but the network doesn't do anything nice like that right and and in the case of network or in the case of traffic you just have to wait right 
So let us say think about traffic again. So what, what would you, if you suddenly found traffic congestion, what would you do uh, James? Pardon me? Get off the highway, what will you do? Get on a different highway, uh, what would you Chandler? Let us say you are going on the, on a, on the interstate uh, you know, from here to Florida and you suddenly see there is a big backup on 75, what will you do? You go around them. <laughs> Everybody else? I mean, the different people may take different approach. Michael? They take smaller roads. Or if it is lunchtime, you might say, well, you know, let me go off and take, get, get, my, get myself lunch. Hopefully, by the time, you know, things are going to clear up, right? So, there are lots of different things. Depending on your point of view, type of personality you are, type A or not, and so on, you may do different things, right? And, and, uh, so it's exactly the same thing that that will happen on the network also. So uh, you know, one uh, one approach is you know, like Peter was saying, well, there could be other people on the highway, right? So that is one way. And so one thing that you can do know is, if I'm sending bits on the wire, and if I'm seeing that my packets are not going through, it indicates that there is a congestion, right? So when there is a congestion, I, you know, I can do what Chandler is saying. I can see if there are other ways of putting bits on the wire. It's not going to help a whole lot. If this is the only pipe, right? If this is the only pipe that's available, you know, you can try putting bits on the wire from something else, but still they all have to get on the same highway, right? And um, the other thing that you can do is you can take the approach of saying, well, you know, I'm going to get off the highway, have a cup of coffee, you know, cool my heels for a little bit, and then I'll get back in again, right? That's another approach that you can take. And that's that's the, so what, what that means in, in the context of uh, the network is that I'm starting to put packets on the wire and I'm seeing that it is not going through and I'll say, well, let me back off. Let me not put any more packets, right? And, uh, and, and you know, it, it, this is, this is, if everybody follows that, right? If all of these guys take the same approach and say, well, let, let me ease up now on the rate at which I'm putting packets on the wire, then the congestion will go away, right? Because in traffic it never happens, right? Everybody wants to still get on the highway, and and uh, so uh, uh, and and that is that is an issue. But uh, but you know, well-behaved protocols, like Peter was saying, well-behaved protocols. What they'll do is they'll observe that there is a congestion, and once they observe that there is a congestion, they'll they'll back off, and 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 uh, uh, and and not be as aggressive. So I, earlier I said that why not blast all the packets, right? Even if I have buffer capacity, let's say I have enough buffer capacity, um, uh, what I want to do is I want to monitor whether the packets are actually going through. And if they're not going through, um, and I know that because I'm waiting for acknowledgments. And the acknowledgments, I expect the acknowledgments to, to come from, uh, from the receiver in two milliseconds. But five milliseconds goes by and nothing comes back, right? Then you know that, well, something is really wrong. And therefore, I can use that as a way of uh, backing off. And that's, uh, that's what is network congestion. This is the way um, you deal with that. And, and good protocols, TCP, we'll talk about that in a minute, is an example of a protocol that does that, which is uh, to say that it does congestion control by, by observing um, you know, how big uh, the backup is and then, and then uh, recovering from that. And uh, so, uh, so any question on network congestion, what that means and how it, you know, how it manifests and how we can uh, logically think about uh, getting around it. I mean, you're all uh, driving on the highway, so you immediately can see, you know, what are all the different things that you can do in order to um, alleviate uh, congestion. So, uh, so in, uh, that's the reason that uh, protocols have this uh, windowing approach. So, I mentioned that don't send all the packets at the same time, but send uh, a subset of the packets, and that subset of the package that you that you send is called a window into uh, uh, the protocol. So here is how uh, uh, windowing works. The basic idea is that this is the this is all the package that I uh, that I that I want to send, right? And this is packet the first packet, second packet, and so on. All of these are packets that I want to send, right? And I decided based on my buffer capacity and my uh, uh, my uh, peers uh, buffer capacity that I can send you know, some number of packets, maybe, you know, uh, 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 20 packets. And that's, that is what is called a window. So let's say that 20 is the window that I have. 
And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send 20 packets. And, and then I'm going to wait to get an acknowledgment. As soon as I get an acknowledgment of one packet, I can slide the window, right? I can, I can slide the window and start sending the next packet. And as acknowledgments keep coming in, I can keep sliding the window. So all of these green boxes that you see are packets that I've sent for which I've gotten the acknowledgment. Okay? And, and the red packets that you see are packets that I have sent and, and I've gotten, not gotten acknowledgment. Okay, and and blue packets is basically what are what are these blue packets? So so these are packets that I've sent and I've got an acknowledgement, and these are packets that I'm that I that I've sent but I don't have acknowledgement yet. And what are these packets? Pardon me. Pardon me. No no these are this is the space that I've got. So this is the active window right? To be sent right. So I still don't you know if I if I have uh, packets to send. I can still send, and the number of packets that I can send is four, right? Because this is a window, and within this window, these many packets have not been acknowledged, but I still have room to send four more packets because that's deciding my buffer capacity, right? And, and so I can send four more packets. But let's say I send these four packets. They'll all become red because all of them are requiring acknowledgments. At that point, I cannot send any more packets until I get an acknowledgment, right? And that's how the sliding window moves. So these white packets, these white space are, 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 are sequence numbers that I cannot send yet because I haven't gotten enough acknowledgments to move the window. Is that idea clear how the sliding window protocol works? Don? Question? Chen, Chen right? Chen, sorry. Dong is over there. Yeah. Yeah. So Chen, any questions on this? Yeah. So is this clear? If I ask you a question. On the exam, you know what to do, right? Okay. So that's how uh, uh, sliding window um, uh, protocol works, and and uh, so this is where the congestion control comes in. So let's say that I pick the window size of uh, 20, okay, and and I know that you know this this red should turn to green after two tau, which is my um, uh, the uh, round trip time, right? So I've decided my round trip time is two milliseconds. Let's say. And therefore, I expect this uh, red to become green after two milliseconds. And let's say five milliseconds go by, and and it doesn't change. Then I know that there is network congestion. So you know, without really knowing anything more than you know the rate at which I'm sending packets and receiving acknowledgments, I can make a determination about the health of the network. That's the nice beauty of this uh, whole protocol is that you know just by local knowledge. Um, you can actually uh, make a global decision. I mean, you've seen some of these uh, uh, um, think locally, act globally, and things like this, <laughs> slogans that you may have seen. That's essentially what is going on here, right? So we're think, thinking locally by looking at the rate at which our reds are becoming green, and that is telling you whether there is network congestion or not. And if you find that there is no network congestion, then life is good, and, and you, can, um, you can continue to do this. But on the other hand, if you find that there is a huge uh, delay for getting acknowledgments. You know that there is network congestion. What are you going to do when there is network congestion, Peter? Pardon me? Wait meaning what? What are you going to do to the windowing protocol? So I have determined now that my reds are turning to green very slowly, right? I, I assume that there is a 2 millisecond um, uh, for getting acknowledgment, but it is actually taking 10 milliseconds. What am I going to do? What am I going to do, Olga? Shrink the window, right? Because this is the rate at which you are placing packets on the wire, and so what I can do is I can shrink my window size. You know, I was aggressive and said I can put 20 packets and then wait for acknowledgement, but I find that there is network congestion because I'm not getting acknowledgements as quickly as I thought I should, and I'm doing more retransmission. So when they, when I don't get acknowledgements, what I'm going to do is. I'm, I still have a trans, retransmission timer that is set to, let's say, two milliseconds, and for five milliseconds I don't get an acknowledgement. I'm going to retransmit packets, right? And and uh, you know that is telling me that there is network congestion. And so, as James said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink the window size and say I won't be as aggressive. Is that idea clear? Right? 
So this is a way we can sort of self-police, right? We are doing self-policing and saying, well, you know, let's not let's not be greedy uh, because the packets are not getting through. Let me uh, reduce the window size so that uh, the congestion clears up. And if the congestion clears up, and if I suddenly find that I'm getting acknowledgments very quickly, then I can increase the window size, right? So the sliding window has two properties. One is you're moving the window based on you know packets that get acknowledged, and also you are shrinking and growing the window size based on the network congestion that you observe. This is exactly what TCP does, okay, in terms of congestion control. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so um, uh, so so you know one of the things that you might wonder about this is uh, if you look at this, uh, what is the width width of each of these uh, packets? Indicating this actually this is the, the increasing sequence numbers, right? And um, and it is also the time order in which you're placing packets on the wire, right? And uh, so what is the width of the time width of each of these? Is is it turnaround time? What is the width of each of these? Abhishek, size of the packet, but you know, I'm, in terms of time, how do you how do you convert the size of the packet to time, Matt? Is it a turnaround time? Is it a turnaround time? The, play, the rate at which you can place the packets on the wire, is it decided by the turnaround time? Nate? Link connection, right? So it is the packet size divided by a link bandwidth. That tells you how much time it's going to take to place a packet on the wire, right? So, so the, the width of this is really the width of you know, decided by a network connectivity. Now, turnaround time comes in in terms of when you get the acknowledgement back, right? So, you, if if uh, um, if I have a uh, um, a pipeline protocol without acknowledgements, basically I'm going to just keep on keep placing these packets on the wire, decided by my connectivity, right? Access connectivity to the uh, to the access network. Is that idea clear? Okay, that's the width of. Uh, um, each of these, and and there are simple pro, uh, pro problems that I uh, that I have in um, uh, in in the book that you should that you should work out on your own and check the solution that I have in the example. So, for instance, here, you know, if I say that if a message has ten packets and the round trip time is two milliseconds, and uh, and and you know, if, you, if the time itself, the time to place the packets on the on the on the wire is in, is negligible compared to the time it takes to actually get the packet delivered to the destination, two milliseconds is the round trip time going and coming back, right? If that is the case and, uh, and the window size is five, how much time is it going to take for doing the complete transmission of 10 packets? How much time? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send five packets, right? Window size is five. I'm going to send five packets and then I'm going to wait. How long will I wait? Pardon me? Two milliseconds, right? You will wait two milliseconds, and if there is no packet loss, and the and the um, uh, you know the the width that I showed you earlier is also very small, negligible compared to two milliseconds. After two milliseconds, I can send the next set of four packets, right? And and then I'll get after two milliseconds from that, I'm going to get the acknowledgments. I'll be all done in four milliseconds. Is that idea clear? Right. So that's how. This, uh, uh, you know, just to think in terms of, you know, how these things work. So there are similar problems that I have. So, uh, let me complete transport, and then then we'll take the break. So it'll take another uh, two minutes or so. So the uh, transport protocols in the internet. You all heard of TCP. Um, anyone know what the acronym stands for? Alex, Drew, what does the acronym TCP stand for? Olga, wild guess. Tran transport control protocol. Close. It's a transport protocol. Uh, Michael. Uh, uh, Alizar. Transmission control. Protocol. TCP stands for transmission control uh, protocol. And and basically, you know, the the TCP has uh, three phases. The first phase is connection setup. Right. You're setting up a connection with your peer. That's where you're negotiating the window size, right? Depending on, you know, uh, if I'm talking to uh, Charles 
uh, maybe he has uh, his TCP um, stack on his machine uses a big buffer and therefore he'll say well you know I can support a window size of 100. Um, maybe when I talk to Drew he says well no I have a Wimpy machine I'm doing it all on my PDA and so you know uh, the, the window size has got to be 20. So that's the thing that, ne that negotiation that goes on in the beginning in terms of connection setup. And once you set up the connection your window size is fixed and you start sending packets right. And as I said earlier during the normal packet transmission you decide uh, uh, you, you decide whether um, there is congestion happening on the network, you, you want to uh, shrink the window size or grow the window size and, and part of connection setup is also deciding how big the retransmission timeout should be right. Because when you are doing the connection setup you are going to find out how long it takes to get uh, the negotiation between uh, me and my peer. So that tells me what should be the transmission timeout, retransmission timeout that I should, that, that I should uh, uh, keep. And so you do all of that and then you can start sending the packets and then finally when you are all done you are going to break down the connection. It is called tear down of the connection and which is where either party you know you, if I am communicating with Charles, Charles can say well I am going to go to lunch, I am you know I am going to uh, sign off right. So either the recipient or the sender can initiate a tear down of the network okay and of the connection and once that connection is thrown down then, then uh, you know packet transmission ceases right. That is essentially how uh, TCP works and um, uh, so the, the, some of the pros are the fact that uh, it is reliable and, and messages arrive in order because it is based on the windowing mechanism. So its packets are um, uh, 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 you know individual, individual packets may go uh, out of order and so on uh, but messages are always in order. So it is entire message that is sent from uh, source to destination and there is complexity in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, connection set up and tear down and, uh, and one of the things is that you know uh, uh, Peter is a nice guy and he says well there may be other flows and therefore I am going to back off right. But on the highway you may well or you know you may have seen often that let us say that you are going on a highway and one lane is closing right. Good guys will move over to the uh, uh, switch over. What do the bad guys do? Speed up and go all the way to the end where the lane is ending and then jump into this right. You seen that? Do you do that? <laughs> so, so you know this happens right. So network also they can be greedy flows. If everybody is using TCP life is good right. Everybody is going to do self policing. But if everybody is not following it then there could be some bad guys who will keep pumping packets and, and you know the nice guys will get hurt right. And this happens and, and UDP is an example of a bad guy and uh, so UDP is, is, a, is a protocol what does UDP stand for? User datagram protocol right and, and basically it is connectionless unregulated and, uh, and there is no acts. So you know it is sort of like you know sending a, a picture postcard to your mom and hoping that it will get there right. So you just, you just put that uh, in the mail and, and, and hopefully it got there right. And that is essentially what, what happens in UDP you are sending um, um, here also you have the same issues that you have a message that is arbitrary in size and therefore you have to break it up into packets and you are sending the packets but you do not worry about acknowledgments okay. You just assume that it all got there. Now if, if uh, it did not get there um, you will find out right. How will you find out? Well eventually the application program is going to know that you know maybe you make a phone call to your mom hey, I sent you a picture postcard oh, I never got it <laughs> right that is how you know and it is the same thing that is going to happen at the application level that um, you have sent this uh, message and you will find out whether it got there or not because application level you are going to do some uh, checking. And, and the nice thing is it is no, it's simple, it's very simple no um, um, uh, frills and, and it is especially suited when there is no packet loss right. If you think about local area network and things like that there are not you know chances of packet loss. So in that case um, UDP may be a good way to, to design uh, certain things and so um, um, this has a lot of overhead in terms of setup and so on. So if I have a basic uh, protocol like this on top of that I can build whatever minimum handshake that I need um, in order to go between the, the source and destination. Um, uh, so in both of these protocols one, one, one problem is that uh, there is no guarantee 
of how quickly your, your message will reach the destination, right. It is sort of like you know if you put something in the US mail you have no guarantee when it is going to get to the destination. They may say it take 2 days, it may take 1 week. Um, uh, you know the, the best case will be what they say it is going to take but, but the worst case you have no bond on it, right. Because it is going to you know it depends on the congestion and so on and that property holds for both of these protocols. There is no guarantee because there is no pre-allocation. See the only way you can have guarantee is if you have pre-allocation of um, uh, network resources between the, the source and the destination. Right. So if, if I if I'm pre-allocated, then I'll know that um, I'll have end end-to-end -end, um, guarantee. That happens on your telephone network. In a telephone network, um, when you make a phone call, um, you you have that connection. A, a circuit is established between the source and the destination, and therefore your conversation can go on till you hang up. Right. And uh, but in this case, uh, there is no bound on on the on the delay. Okay. Now given that. There is no bond in the delay. Would you use that if you use, you know, seeing a movie or you know, many of these real-time things require you to have continuous uh, uh, coverage, right? So if you're watching sport on uh, on your internet uh, or um, watching a movie, would you use TCP or UDP? Pardon me. Probably. Well, both of them don't have the property that uh, that it, that is going going to give you guarantee on delay. But it turns out that you always have work around these, right? So you know that it doesn't have the property. So what do applications typically do? They actually, you know, before you, let's say I want to start watching a movie, okay? The application is not going to start streaming to your uh, 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 to your display immediately. It's going to buffer some amount of it, right? It knows that you know the, that network is um, can uh, there could be vagaries in the network, and so it is going to overcome that by other means and therefore what you find is in spite of all the things that I said about TCP and UDP if you look at uh, all the things that you use in your everyday life most of them either most of them use TCP and very few of them use uh, UDP, uh, UDP so for instance web browser uses TCP instant see the, these are the requirements that you have for these applications the web browsing you want reliable messaging in order arrival of messages so those are properties that you want and so TCP provides you that right. So you are going to see that. So you see that wherever there is reliable messaging required um, you will see that TCP is the one that, uh, that you want to use. Um, but on the other hand if you think about voice over IP you know uh, how many of you have Vonage. So you know there, there are these IP based uh, uh, phone services available now and if you have voice over IP um, there you are not you know if I did not hear something I am going to say hey, what did you say. <laughs> right? So you don't have uh, you don't need that same kind of reliability because you can you know humans are at the two ends and so it is latency that is the most important thing and 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 so UDP is good for that right because it doesn't have no frills no acts nothing and and at the application level you can take care of anything that is lost right if packets get lost I'm not going to hear what you said I'm going to say hey what did you say <laughs> so that way you can sort of get end to end um, agreement on whether the uh, data got through. So for that usually UDP is used but most of the other places you will see that uh, it is TCP that is used and this, this is this should come as a surprise to you well actually not a big surprise. I said that you know if you want to watch video um, you want low latency but you also want uh, reliability you know you do not want uh, things to go um, uh, uh, you, if, if, if the movie is too choppy you will not like it right. So you want all the uh, uh, bits to come through and, and TCP is good for that and, and the way it, it accounts for these vagaries is to have buffering right and, and that is the way it is it's, it's usually done. So, um, so this is the uh, last slide I want to put up on, on transport protocol and uh, so next we are going to talk about link layer so let us take a short break and we may do a uh, quick PRS and then we will do um, link layer.
So let's see. Two. At first, you were being able to devise two from the moon. Well, <laughs> let's see. Uh, let, let's let's do the the next one also, and we'll come back to this. All right, so this is the highest bar in the previous question also. <laughs> There's something wrong here, right? <laughs> right? So, so you know, direct memory access, as the name suggests, it's got, to, it's got to be something that has access to memory directly to move data back and forth, right? So two is the right answer for this guy. So if you got two for question two, that's good. Um, you understand? Or if you just sort of, you're hedging your bets. <laughs> <laughs> Still, it is good that you hedged it the right way. Um, now, if if you for this question, program transfer means that the processor is in the middle of it, right? Program transfer means you know whenever you, see, you say program, processor is in the middle of it because the processor is the only thing that can execute a program, and uh, so so the processor is the one that's going to move the data back and forth from the device to the memory using load store instruction. So the right answer is three. Right? Everybody with me here on this? Okay. You were not with me when you did the question, some of you, um, most of you. Uh, so, but you know, you understand that uh, uh, program transfer corresponds to the processor being in the middle of moving bits between the device and the memory, and it is going to use load store instructions. Okay. Um, but on the other hand, for uh, for DMA, um, you know, the process is out of the loop. Once the uh, the uh, DMA is initiated, the device, uh, the DMA controller can directly move the bits back and forth between the device and the memory. Right? Everybody with me here? Any questions on this? Okay. Okay. Um, now, this is something that we did today or uh, last week. So let's see if. All right, so uh, everybody knows what this is. That's very good. Uh, did I skip a question? How did we get to question four? I did. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. Well, so it'll get jumbled, but I'll remember. Give me a perfect score, oh, ma. Well, you, I'm really surprised with this one. I thought this I'm going to get a perfect score on this one. You know that the the transport layer, its primary function is this right here, right? It is it is to take a message and break it up into packets and send it. So at the sending end, it breaks it up into packets. Receiving end, it assembles into a message. And so scatter gather of the packets is the uh, role because it's not. It's not implementing Ethernet protocol. I haven't even told you what it is. Cannot be. Uh, cannot be this. Cannot be. Um, uh, cannot be this. And it cannot be this. Right? So it's really this. Uh, uh, this is the functionality that is in the transport layer. So one of the nice things that uh, you know we keep talking about abstractions. One of the nice things about the transport, um, 
what does when we talked about transport protocol, whether it's stop and wait or pipeline protocol, uh, what is where does network come in in the transport protocol? Where in all the things that we talked about in the transport protocol, where is the notion of network anywhere in the transport protocol? Could be using wireless, could be using you know wired connection, uh, Bluetooth. It doesn't matter. But where does it come in? Does it do you, do you see that in any in anything in the transport protocol? I will show you the header. So, this is, this is good. So, we can, we can quit this. Um. So, if you, if you look at, uh, if you look at this uh, picture here, where does, where does network appear in this? This is what the transport protocol is doing, right? This is the way it is uh, interfacing with the rest of the protocol stack. Transport is at the top, application, and then transport, and the rest of it is below that, right? So if you look at this, where does transport, where, where does the network come in? In uh, Jen, does the network come into that? Where, where is there anywhere that the, the the characteristic of the network comes in into this? Not <laughs> so. Think of it that way. What you know? What is the answer? <laughs> it doesn't come. Well, I mean, it's got to be somewhere, right? But what we have done is this is the power of abstraction. That's the reason that you don't see it at all, right? It's the power of abstraction that it doesn't really matter what you're using as the network. At the transport level, the only thing that has anything to do with network. I mean, yes, you know, somebody said destination address, but th that's again logical. Um, you know, it's just giving you a number that says this is what Shashank's computer is, and we, later on we're going to see IP address, right? And that's the way we know that. The only thing that really says anything about the network is the packet size. In some fashion, it's just saying this is the packet size I'm going to use in order to send uh, bits on the wire, and that's what it is passing onto the network layer. It doesn't know whether the network is going to take that and then put the packet as is or is it going to break it further it doesn't know any of that right all it says that is that you know this this, this is all um, metadata right which is saying how to go from from me to my peer that's all it is saying and network has to figure that out and you can say well this is another one that um, that is the link between the transport and the network is the destination address which is saying you know this is the uh, the destination address and this is the packet size. These are the two things that that really um, has meaning so far as the network is concerned. It doesn't really know anything about uh, the characteristics of the network, or what physical medium it's going to use, and so on. Right? That's the beauty of the power of abstraction, that we can we can completely uh, not have to deal with any of the details of how the bits are actually going to flow. And I talked about congestion control and things like that. All of that we're perceiving based on what is happening at the transport level by just how quickly I'm going to get acknowledgments and things like that, right? So all of those things are, are, are being subsumed by, um, uh, by, by, um, by these two uh, uh, things, the packet size and the destination address. These are the only two things that, that you need to know. And um, that also brings us to the next part of our discussion. And so I said that, you know, if you look at the protocol stack, um, there is the application, and then there is a transport, and then there is a network, and then there is a link, um, and then there is physical, right? So these are all the things, and so we, we know uh, how this works. And uh, the next one we, we, we should be looking at is network, but I'm going to skip this and come back to it uh, on Thursday, but we're going to go and look at link layer protocol, um, because we want to understand how things are put on the wire. And, uh, and then we'll come back to the, 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 the main role that the network layer performs is given the destination address, it's going to know how to send that uh, uh, to the next hub because that's what we simulated, right, last time. And, and, and the way it does that is by knowing what is the next hub to send it to. And, and so a lot of it is to do with how it keeps that table up to date in terms of knowing what is the next stop, given a destination address. We'll see all of that on Thursday, but we're going to jump here and look at uh, the link layer protocol next. Okay. 
so uh, if you if you uh, one of the uh, fun things that uh, that that happened in uh, networking is the fact that uh, you know uh, uh, local area network is where it all started in terms of uh, network in innovation and uh, and the link layer the, this part is the one that is responsible for getting access to the physical medium okay so that we can actually put the bits out on the wire and uh, and and there are two sort of broad classifications of link layer protocols one is um, called random access and uh, and we'll look at that and uh, uh, ethernet is an example of that and and the second is what is called uh, 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 taking turns and 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 we'll look at an example of that which is a token ring and and the portion of the protocol so in the link layer uh, there's a portion of the protocol that deals with gaining access to the physical medium because here you you finally got some uh, you know uh, this is a wire right and um, and and you have to get access to the wire in order to actually put the bits out on the wire whether it is the wire is uh, uh, virtual in terms of a wireless connection or or, or, or um, uh, uh, um, uh, real electrical wire or is, is it uh, a photonic switching it doesn't really matter but it has to get access to that and and the, the part of the protocol that that deals with gaining access to the physical medium is called media access and control layer MAC is you, something that you've heard uh, often right so media access and control has to do with the fact that the link layer has to get a hold of the physical wire before it can start putting bits on the wire and and when it put, puts bit, bits on the wire that's the po uh, uh, point that decides how big, uh, you know, how many bits it can put on the wire at any point of time, right? And and that depends on the physical medium, and that's why there is a separation. So between here and here, you know, the only interface is a packet size, right? So given given a particular packet size, so the transmission layer, um, uh, transport layer says here is the packet size, here is the destination. Network layer says, well, you know, I'm going to use for this particular um, uh, 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 destination address. I'm going to use a particular link layer. I have to go through a wireless hop in order to get to my destination, and 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 on that wireless uh, link, um, I cannot put the packet as is. I have to break it up into what are called frames and give it to the link layer. Okay, and and link layer decides that oh the frame size is such and so based on the physical medium on which it is going to put the bits, and and then it says this is a uh, the frame size. So if I have a if I have a packet that is uh, 1k bits, and if the link layer says that oh you have to frame it in 100 bits, then I'm going to put 100 bits and then send it on uh, out on the wire. At that level, we are not talking about packet uh, reassembly or anything like that. Now, now it is really physically I'm putting the bits on the wire, and all of those frames um, are going to follow one another. Is that idea clear? Is the difference between the packet that is being talked about here and the way the packet is broken up into into frames between the network and the link layer okay so that's what is going on so we'll look at ethernet as uh, one example um, now let's say that you know you're all in a uh, in a conference room and you know this is a classroom it's different dynamics are different but if you're in a in a conference room and and you're having a group discussion what is the etiquette for how you how, how one talks in, in a conference room like that, what is the etiquette that you would follow, Charles? Yeah, well, you, you, you know, uh, you, you know, you, you could you could take one of two possibilities. You could take turns, but that's kind of boring, right? And you know, if you're having group group discussion, um, you have some idea, you want to talk about it. Um, so, what would you do, Abhishek? Yeah. Well, I mean, so, so but 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 everybody is around a table and. And, and multiple people can have ideas at the same time, right? And multiple people can start talking at the same time. And and uh, and what's going to happen in that case? If multiple people start talking at the same time, Alex, in a, in a, around a table. Yeah. So one one of them is going to yield to the other, and then you know because you know both of us start, started talking at the same time. You say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, and then one of us is going to give up. And the other person is going to go right. That's exactly how Ethernet works. Exactly. If you understand how the dynamics of group discussion around a round table, exactly how Ethernet works. Ethernet is you can think of it as a bus, okay. And and we talked about buses inside the uh, a box, right, which connects all the elements like the processor, 
memory and, and the uh, I.O. devices, they're all connected using the bus. Ethernet is also a bus. Only difference is this bus goes across buildings, right? Potentially across rooms and buildings. And in the case of a bus that is inside the box, you can have arbitration. We talked about arbitration. What is arbitration? What is arbitration? Any idea? What is bus arbitration? We talked about that. Chris? Who is deciding who gets? So right now I am using the bus. Next bus cycle, somebody else wants to use it. They all compete. And one, you pick a winner. So that, that is called bus arbitration, right? And, uh, uh, and, and the same thing needs to happen on the Ethernet also. But unfortunately, on the Ethernet, there are lots of devices, not all in the same box, right? And, and so the protocol for um, arbitration has got to be different. And, and that's why this analogy of uh, what happens around a round table is, is useful. Because what you're going to do is, you know, uh, around a round table, what you're doing is you start talking, assuming that you have the floor, right? But you might find that Alex is talking at the same time. So what, we're going to, what is going to happen is we're colliding, right? And, and uh, you realize that, oh, both of us have started talking at the same time. And so one of us is going to back off. And Alex being the nice, nice guy, he may be the one that backs off and I'll, and I'll continue talking, right? And, and if more devices, more people start talking at the same time, same thing is going to happen, right? You back off and then, and then eventually you get your turn. So the assumption in Ethernet protocol is that um, you have the media. I talked about media access and control. You assume that you have the media. Go ahead and start transmitting. And, uh, and if you, if, if you uh, see there is a collision, then you realize that there is a collision and you know the etiquette around the round table you'll say ah, i'm sorry right equivalent of that in um, uh, in, in in ethernet is to send uh, a noise blast you know there's a particular noise signal that you send out i mean have you you know uh, there are not too many am radios these days but um, uh, on am radios sometimes you can hear a static when a when a car goes by or something like that right that kind of noise is what you send out on the on the Ethernet wire to to indicate that there is a collision, so that all the listeners know that there was a collision, and 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 if uh, multiple people are starting to talk at the same time, they can actually uh, recognize that there was a collision, and and once they recognize that there's a collision, then they can take back off and then come back again. So that's essentially what this protocol state diagram is showing. I need to transmit, and I listen for the carrier, meaning you know I want to see if there is a noise if there is anybody using the medium. If nobody is using the medium, then I'm assuming that the medium is idle and I'm going to transmit the message. Okay? And, and, and when I transmit the message, uh, then I'm going to look for collision. And if there is no collision, I continue transmitting the message. Okay? And when I'm done, done with the transmission, I can, I can, I can uh, leave the medium, that the transmission is complete. On the other hand, what can happen is you d detect a collision. Right? And when you detect a collision, then you abort the transmission, immediately send out a noise blast saying that, well, you know, whatever I tried to send didn't get through and, and, and I'm going to go back here and I get, get into this position of uh, listening to the, um, um, uh, to the carrier and, and if the medium is not idle, I keep, keep here waiting for the carrier to be available, right? So this is the basic protocol, okay? And there are some nuances here. And the first thing is, let's say that, you know, Alex and I start talking at the same time. And, and we realize that there's a collision. And, and uh, we immediately start talking, hey, that's a problem, right? We can continuously have collisions. So one of us has to back off, right? And how much do I back off? Well, initially, Alex may say, okay, I'm going to back off for a minute, let uh, Kishore talk. And, uh, and, and, you know, after I'm done with that, he's going to try again. And let's say next time when he tries, Shane also starts talking, okay? And so he has another collision. Then he says, okay, I'm going to back off a little bit more because I'm a nice guy. I don't want to, you know, compete with these guys. They want to talk, let them talk. So, so he's going to back off some more. So, you know, this time he's going to back off some more than the previous time right? because he sees that a lot of people want to talk. I'm going to wait for my turn by backing off, right? This is what is called exponential back off. So the amount of time that you wait exponentially keeps increasing. And the reason is very simple that, you know, every, every time you try, try to transmit, hopefully the medium is, is idle, right? I can get, get, uh, start transmitting. But if you find that the medium is not idle, 
then you wait for some time and try again, but you find the medium is still busy, okay. In that case, what you assume is that a lot of people wanting to transmit at the same time. So let me back off some more, okay. So if I waited for one millisecond, I wait for two milliseconds next. Try again. Again, I find that there is a collision. Wait for four milliseconds. So keep exponentially increasing the, uh, the amount of time that I wait for and that is what is called exponential back off, right. So there is a protocol that works really well when there is no, um, uh, you know, when, when the medium is not used uh, very heavily, then you can actually, you know, um, uh, 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 try to get the medium, if you do not get it, back off and then try again and so on. Um, and uh, so, you know, is this idea clear how this, how this works? And you can get this arbitration done in this manner without having any central arbiter entirely locally, right. Locally you are listening to the carrier and making a determination whether the medium is free and, and, and you are also making a determination how busy the medium is by seeing how often you collide. Keep colliding then you know that the medium is really busy so you wait for longer periods of time, okay. That is the idea behind um, the Ethernet protocol. And, and this is the way Ethernet came about but, uh, but today uh, you have heard of switched Ethernet. How many of you have heard of switched Ethernet? Have you heard of Ethernet? Okay. So Ethernet protocol is this, okay. But, uh, but these days, uh, uh, you know, there are switched Ethernets and, uh, and there uh, what happens is that, you know, we will see shortly when I mean, we talk about different kinds of network gear that, that you can get that uh, the collision is actually re really limited to a smaller set. In, in principle, if you are on the Ethernet and, uh, and the entire campus uh, backbone is on Ethernet, everybody can be colliding with everybody, right? It does not happen anymore fortunately uh, because the uh, domain of collision is going to be much smaller than that and we will talk about that later on when we looked at switched Ethernet. But this is the, the one kind of protocol that I want you to know and we will talk about uh, uh, details of uh, Ethernet protocol on Thursday. And my goal is, my goal was to finish link today and then do network and I might still uh, try to combine link and uh, uh, network on, on Thursday and try to wrap that up so that um, we can move on to um, storage next week.